I didn't take an opportunity to share praise when Brother Steve asked for those, but I, I definitely appreciate it. Um, Dylan and, and uh, Tim aren't here this morning, but they gave me a hand, moved, uh, moved a couple of bunk beds over to the, the homeless shelter for some families that needed those, so appreciate everybody that, that's willing to jump in and help wherever help is needed on a, on a frequent basis. That happens all the time, so appreciate that. Um, this morning's kind of a strange morning in, in some ways. I, I, I kind of hope um, in many ways that this message is completely irrelevant to, to many of you, <laughs> um, which sounds weird. Um, but we're going to talk about something that's, that's kind of powerful and, it, and it's, it, it, it kind of pushes deep a little bit. Because we're going to talk, talk a little bit about, um, about family. Um, and I know sometimes um, that, that cuts us close and, and sometimes it, it speaks into some areas of, of hurt or, or hardship for some of you. But um, this morning, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when you talk with people. We are all shaped in some fashion, in some form by our upbringing. It just is, the people that are in our lives or the people that are missing from our lives. Um, it, it's, we've been, our men's fraternity, it's, it's been a neat journey kind of walking through that, kind of learning a little bit more about um, just our own upbringing and how that shapes us and in, in, into who we become and, and as God kind of works in concert with that. Um, so this morning, you know, the, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd love for everybody to kind of be here to kind of say, hey, you know, I had a perfect childhood, um, you know. Uh, everything was great, you know, dad was home all the time, you know, during the day, you know, he came home at the end of the day, and mom tucked us into bed, and, and my brothers and sisters were my best friends, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that may not resemble your childhood at all, and one of the things I think is important for you to know is that you're not alone in that. Um, if, you, if you read through the most famous family tree in Bible, you'll find that there is significant and serious damage in the most famous family tree in the Bible significant and serious damage there. Let me just, let me give you a part of this lineage. Adam accuses his wife, Eve, right away. Cain kills his little brother, Abel. Abraham lied about his wife, Sarah. Rebecca favored her youngest son, Jacob. Jacob would lie to his father, Isaac, cheat his brother, Esau, favor his son, Joseph, and raise a gang of degenerates. That's the famous family tree. And guess who else comes in this family tree at some point? Jesus shows up in this family tree down the... So I just want you to know, I mean, if that resembles, you know, if there's, if there's struggle and difficulty and, and, and damage in your family tree, you're not alone. And actually, if you, if you spend some time and you start to read through Joseph's family tree, you'll find more heart-wrenching stories than heartwarming stories. There's just horrible heart-wrenching stories in this family. Um, when you think about Joseph in his story, and that's where we've been over the last several weeks, what happened to him? He obviously is abandoned by his brothers. Did he deserve for that to happen to him? Did he deserve to be abandoned? No, probably not. He, I mean, he caused some friction. He, he obviously bragged about his dreams in front of his brothers, which probably didn't go over well, and he kind of tattled on them because they weren't doing the right thing, and, and they got upset with him. But it didn't, that didn't you know, mean it was right for them to kind of throw him into a pit, but that's what they, that's what they do. And the people that were supposed to look out for him, his older brothers, are the people that throw him into a pit and then sell him into slavery for pocket change. And so when you think about Joseph's brothers and the dysfunction and the damage that's there, the other thing, as I'm looking through their story, if there was ever anyone in the Bible that really could use some kind of like family and marriage counseling, it was Jacob, his father. Because think about this for a second. His first mistake was he married a woman he didn't love, Leah, in order to marry a woman he did love, Rachel. And, and to make matters worse, these two were sisters. That's not a good idea in anybody's playbook ever. If he had sat down for some marriage counseling, the counselor would have said, do not do this. Whatever you do, do not do this. Don't, first of all, don't marry someone you don't love. Secondly, don't marry that person hoping you'll get it to the person you will eventually love. Um, and, and certainly don't marry them if they're sisters. Um, the first sister, Leah, if you, if you look back through the story, through their history, Leah would have six sons and a daughter. Um, Rachel, and Leah's the first wife, the one he didn't love. The wife he does love, Rachel, has no children at all. And in that day and time, it was viewed as a blessing from God if you had a really large family. You were viewed as being blessed if you had a really large family. So, so Leah has six sons and a daughter. Rachel has no children. And so Jacob decides, you know, in order to give off the appearance that I'm incredibly blessed and my family's really big, he ends up sleeping with two servant girls to enlarge his family to the point of ten sons and one daughter. 
There again, not, you know, marriage and family counseling, heavily needed in this, in this whole dynamic here. Rachel, his favorite wife, finally gives birth to his son, Joseph, who becomes his favorite son. And then Rachel would later die giving birth to a second son named Benjamin. And she basically leaves Jacob with this dysfunctional household and really kind of a broken heart. That's who he loved, and now she was, she was gone. So you read through the story a little bit more, and you, you realize the way that Jacob copes with all of this dysfunction and heartache is he basically checks out as a parent. He just kind of checks out. That's how he copes with all of this dysfunction and this damage. He just steps out. And, and we start to see kind of signs of this when, when Joseph goes to his brothers. Remember the story? He goes to his brothers and, and tells the dream that, hey, you're all going to bow down to me. What, what was Jacob's response the first time? None. Didn't say anything. He didn't step in and say, hey, Joseph, that may be true, but let's, you know, let's tone it down. He doesn't say anything. He just stays silent. And then you see another little sneak peek in, in, the, in chapter 37 of Genesis when Jacob finds out that the older brothers have taken the sheep to go graze at Shechem. And that doesn't seem like a big deal. We read through these stories and we're like, okay, they took the sheep over to Shechem. Who cares? Shechem, they were told to stay away from Shechem. The older brothers were told to stay away from there because that had been a place of prior conflict. If you back up into chapter 34, you find out some bad stuff happened at Shechem. And Jacob said, hey, you're, like, you're making my name a mockery. We need to back out of this. We need to stay away from here. So they take the sheep to Shechem, and that's where they're grazing. And instead of Jacob going himself to check on the boys, he sends his son. Jacob sends his son to do a father's job. So we have kind of a mixed up and a messed up family. We have obstinate sons, we have an oblivious dad, we have brothers that need a father, we have a father that needs a wake-up call, you have Joseph who needs guidance and instead he gets neglected and he ends up in a, a distant and dark land. And it kind of brings us to where we're kind of getting to this morning. Joseph initially chooses not to face his past. He kind of chooses not to face it. By the time Joseph sees his brothers again. He's been prime minister of Egypt for almost 10 years at this point. And instead of the shepherd's pouch and the staff that he had, he now has, you know, the king's ring and he has gold chains. And, and instead of that, that, you know, that coat of many colors, that's been replaced with this royal robe. And Joseph has fitting in well to Egypt's culture, and he's running the show as the prime minister. And so he's done really, really well. But the thought that just kind of captured my, my attention a little bit is as you look at Joseph and how he ascended to where he was at and the dynamic of his family, the thing that kind of just struck me is that Joseph could travel anywhere he wanted at this point, yet he chooses not to go back and see his family. I thought that was kind of an interesting thought. This guy had risen to the point of the prime minister of Egypt. He had everything at his disposal. He could have gone back. He could have taken an army of Egyptian soldiers and gone back to Canaan and settled the score with his brothers. He had all of the resources available to him to do that. He could have said, you know what? You guys sold me out. You threw me in a pit. You wanted to kill me. You decided not to kill me. You sold me instead. He could have taken an army and just marched back into Canaan and said, you know what? I'm going to make this. We're going to settle the score right now. He could have sent for his father or at least sent him a message, and he doesn't do either one. From what we can glean from scriptures, it appears as if Joseph had nearly eight years to reach out to his family, yet he chose not to contact any of them. I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. He, he keeps his family secrets a secret. He keeps all of this kind of dysfunction and damage kind of tucked away in the back. He doesn't want to deal with it. They stay there kind of untouched and untreated. And, and Joseph was content to kind of leave the past in the past. Here's the thing, though, you guys. God's not content with that. God's not content with having us leave the past in the past. God couldn't leave it there because restoration matters to God. And so God understands that the healing of our hearts involves the healing of the past. I know a lot of times we talk about being a new creation in Christ and we get a fresh start and that's all true, but sometimes there's oftentimes there's stuff in our past that we still need to come to terms with somehow, some way. And so God shakes things up. Watch what happens. Genesis chapter 41, verse 57. It says, every nation came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, for the famine was severe in every land. And of all the people standing in this long line to get help, Genesis 42.3 says that 10 of Joseph's brothers 
went down to buy grain from Egypt. So think about this. Joseph makes no plans whatsoever to go see his family. God uses a famine to bring his family to him instead. I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. A lot of times we look at this and go, well, that was just circumstantial. That would mean that God didn't have an ultimate plan and a purpose in all of this. And while we talked a few weeks ago about I don't believe it was God's hand that caused the famine, God's not beyond using something negative or using a difficult situation to bring restoration and healing. He's not, a, he's not opposed to doing that. We're going to pick up the story. If you've got a Bible with you there, um, Genesis 42, we're going to pick up in verse 4. And I didn't, print, I didn't have all these up because it's just kind of some lengthy reading, but we'll just get a bigger, kind of a bigger taste of, of what's happening now that these brothers have made their way into Egypt after not seeing Joseph. Actually, they haven't seen each other for 20 years. 20 years. Joseph was, was 17 when he was sold into slavery. He's 13 when he becomes the prime minister. They have seven years. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say 13? Uh, 30. I'm sorry, he's moving back in time. He's 17 when he goes to Egypt. He's 30 when he becomes prime minister. There's seven years of, of wealth and abundance, and now the next seven years of famine begins. So he's, it's been about 20 years since he's seen his family, and that's kind of where we pick up in verse 4 of Genesis 42. It says, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he thought something might happen to him. The sons of Israel were among those who came to buy grain, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Joseph was in charge of the country. He sold grain to all its people. His brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. And when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. And I just want us to press pause for a moment. I wonder, what went through Joseph's mind the moment he recognized he saw those, saw those older brothers? I, I, I just wonder kind of what went through his mind. You remember he had named his firstborn son Manasseh, God has made me forget. I have to imagine that somehow seeing others with the money in their hand, all of a sudden some pretty painful memories came, came back. I have to imagine, you know, hey, God has made me forget but that has brought back some painful, painful memories. The last time, think about this, the last time he had seen his older brothers, they were laughing and making a deal as he was begging for his life and being led into slavery in Egypt. That was the last time he had seen them. That was the last time he had heard anything about them. That was the last time there were any glances exchanged or words exchanged. It was as they were selling him into slavery. And that was it. We're going to keep reading here. But he... Joseph treated them like strangers and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan to buy food, they replied. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And, and you have to kind of understand the culture to understand why that probably was. He was now an Egyptian. Joseph was an Egyptian by all rights and, and purposes. He was performing the functions of leadership within Egypt, which meant you kind of looked like, talked like, sound alike an Egyptian. Back in those days, the big thing was most of the leadership were bald. And they, they had like black wigs that they wore. And they had like black eye makeup. If you look back to some of the old pictures of Egyptians, that's what they look like. So this guy is 20 years older, kind of the black wig, the black eye makeup. You know, they, they're, they're not recognizing each other. There's, there's been a lot of time that's, that's elapsed. Verse 9 says, Joseph remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the weakness of the land. He, he was kind of, he, he knew why they were there, but he was kind of putting it on them, saying, I know why you're here. You're here to spy out Egypt, to find out where our weaknesses are, that, so you can kind of mount an attack at some point. Verse 10 says, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food, they said. We are all sons of one man. We are honest, or we are telling the truth. Your servants are not spies. No, he said, verse 12, you come to see the weakness of the land. But they replied, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no longer living. Did you catch that? That's the first family update Joseph has had in 20 years. And he finds out a couple of things. Actually, he finds out three very important things. He finds out, first of all, his dad is still alive, and he's glad. He finds out his baby brother is alive. He also finds out that the rest of the family thinks he's dead. That's, he find, in this one statement, he finds out all this information. Verse 14 says, Then Joseph said to them, I've spoken. You are spies. This is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. 
Send one from among you to get your brother. So Joseph's deal is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock nine of you up and send one of you back to go get your little brother, brother and bring him back. And that's what he says. Send one from among you to get your brother. The rest of you will be imprisoned so that your words can be tested to see if they are true. If they are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. Verse 17, so Joseph imprisoned them together for three days. So just like that, Joseph kind of snaps his finger. His brother's hands are bound. They're marched off to jail. And you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking this is probably the same prison he spent at least a couple years of his life in. You think? I mean, I'm just thinking that's probably the same place. He probably marches them right back to the same prison he had spent at least a couple years of his life. So think about this. What a, what a crazy series of events. You have, this, you have Joseph with this, this harsh tone and this harsh treatment. This is a sequence of events that we've seen before with Joseph and his brothers, but the roles are reversed now. Remember the first time? It was his brothers that conspired against Joseph. This time it's Joseph conspiring against his brothers. His brothers throw him in a pit. He throws them into prison. So what's going on, right? Because up until now, Joseph has been the model of what to do. Joseph has been kind of that, I, I mean, I read the story of Joseph leading up to this point, and I'm like, you can't be that good. This guy can't be like that solid of a guy. There's got to there's be some, some angst. There's got to be some anger. There's got to be some, something in there. But up until now, he has been kind of the poster boy of, of how to navigate through and thrive in the middle of like really difficult situations. He's, he's the guy. But now, now all of this, what's going on with Joseph, do you think? Why, why all of a sudden does everything kind of change? Why all of a sudden does, does his demeanor and his attitude and his actions all of a sudden shift kind of 180 degrees? He goes from, you know, just kind of taking everything in stride to you're going to jail. And, and you're staying here until I let you loose. I, I personally, reading through the story, and I think, I think most of us would understand, if you've got, if you had difficult places in your family somewhere, in your family relationships, you understand how difficult and how challenging these things are. You understand that for Joseph, this is probably the toughest challenge of his life. I, I thought about that as, as read through his story. All of the things that Joseph faced, and they were difficult, I don't think any of them compared to this event. I don't think anything compared to seeing his brother's face to face once again and having to deal with all of this hurt and all of this hate and it's kind of all mixed in and now what do I do with this? I think Joseph is just trying to, he's trying to get his bearings. He's just kind of like, man, I don't know what to do with this. I can handle famine relief. You know, I can handle being locked up in prison for a couple extra years and forgotten. I can handle all the assignments that Pharaoh throws at me. I can handle Mrs. Potiphar's advances. I can handle all this. What I can't figure out is how to deal with all this hurt and this hate, hate that mixes in when we're talking about family and the hurt that they've caused and the damage they've caused. What do I do with that? Joseph is just kind of struggling here. And maybe that strikes a familiar chord for, for some of you some of you here today, there's a chance that some of you here may have felt somewhere along the line that your family kind of let you down somewhere. That, you know, that the people that were supposed to be there for you weren't. Or the people that were supposed to guide you didn't. Like Joseph, you've, you've probably made the best of it. That's what Joseph did. He kind of takes all of this damage and he kind of makes the best of it. And he just kind of moves on. And, 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 and the problem is, is he, he's, kind of, he's kind of happy to leave Canaan in the rearview mirror. And a lot of us, that's what we do. We kind of take all of this hurt and all this heartache and all of this hardship stuff, and we go, man, I can't fix it. I'm just not going to dwell on it. I'm not, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to bury it in the past, and I'm just going to move forward and not realize the impact that it's made and the, and the impact that it's, that it's taken in our lives. See, God loves us too much to let unresolved hurt and heartache continue unresolved. He loves us too much to let unresolved hurt and heartache remain unresolved. And here's what I'm learning in some, some very real ways. God not only wants our heart, our whole heart, he wants our heart whole. There's a difference. There's a difference there. Because I think sometimes we, we push so much to just give God your whole heart. Well, that's great. But he's not satisfied with just that. He actually wants your heart whole. And here's why. Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. Think about it for a moment. Have you ever wondered why you react so harshly? 
You ever wondered why you avoid conflict? You ever wondered why you have trust issues? You ever wonder why you, know, you try to please people so much? You ever wonder why that's there? Maybe it has something to do with unhealed hurt in your heart. God doesn't want us hurting and he doesn't want us hurting others. And here's what we need to know. God wants to help you for your sake and for the sake of those who come behind you. God wants to help you for your sake and for the sake of those that come behind you. Think through this hypothetical scenario with me for just a moment. What would happen, what would have happened if Joseph refused to deal with his brothers? What if he shunned the opportunity that God had given him through the difficulty of the famine? What if he shunned this opportunity? What if he just said, you know what? Instead of seeking an opportunity for healing, I just perpetuate the heartbreak in my family? What if he just, he saw his brothers, he recognizes them, and instead of kind of confronting and dealing, he sees them and just kind of walks the other way and says, I don't want anything to do with them. I am pushing myself completely away. I'm not going to deal with them and all the damage they caused. What would have happened? What's interesting is to, to understand and to see that God's plan for the nation of Israel depended upon the, com- the compassion of Joseph. God's whole plan for the nation of Israel depended upon Joseph's compassion. There was a lot at stake with this family and, and, and restoration that God was trying to seek for him and for that family. And the reality that we have to understand is that there's a lot, of, there's a lot at stake in each and every one of our families. And, and, and the right thing and the Christian thing not to do is just to forget about it and just step on. That's not, that's not what God does. That's not what he desires of us. He doesn't say, well, we're just going to forget about the heartache and the hurt and the pain. He doesn't say, well, I'm not going to deal with that. He says, no, I want to be, be introduced into that. I want to help heal and restore and make whole again. We read a story last week about these lepers that Jesus would come to, and, and he heals them. Remember the story? There's 10 of them, and nine of them don't come back, but one does. Do you remember what Jesus said at the very end of that story? He said, your faith has made you whole. It's kind of an interesting thing. These other guys are healed, but only one of them left whole. We're reminded that's what God ultimately wants. He not only wants healing for us, he wants us whole. He wants us well. There's a lot at stake. There was a lot at stake with Joseph and his family. There's a lot at stake with you and yours. I've shared um, before how my, my dad's father raised him and his brothers. I, I think I've shared that in times past. And in, in my dad's household, when he was a little kid growing up, there was a whole lot of labor, not much love. You were a workforce, in a sense, as a child in, in, in that household. And, 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 the, and the reality is, he, my, my dad's father came by that honestly. His father raised him that way, and his father raised him that way. I mean, it's just generational. You can kind of go back. There wasn't much love. You were just kind of a workforce. You did what you were told, and because you were told to do it, you weren't really appreciated. You were just kind of used and taken advantage of. Not a whole lot of love, but a whole lot of labor. I can remember, as a child, a completely different upbringing, though. I, I can remember my dad hugging us often. And, and I, I've told the story before. I, I'll never forget it as long as I live. He would get up from the table, the, the dinner table, to go get more coffee, which was his weakness. That I did pick up from him. Um, I, I received that, 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 that trait, I guess. But I remember him leaving the, the table during dinner or whatever to go get some more coffee. And as he would, he wouldn't hesitate to, to just to kiss one of us kids on top of the head. He just did that. And, and I, can remember, I can remember asking him, just shortly before Carrie and I were married, I remember asking him, Dad, how did you love us so well when you didn't have that in your own life? And I remember him telling me that, you know what, when I came to know Christ as my Savior and you kids were born, he said, I made a decision that with God's help, that lack of love that had been in my family was going to stop with me. And it did. It did. Maybe this morning, there's someone here that needs to make that same resolution in their own family. There may have been some pretty sad chapters in your family's history, but here's a truth that we need to embrace and and a truth that we need to act on. Your history does not have to be your future. All of that generational garbage, I, I was gonna say a different word, but that's a nicer word, generational garbage can stop with you. Right here, right now. You can say, you know what, with God's help, 
It doesn't have to go on. I don't have to hand the hurt and the heartache off to someone else that I was handed growing up or as a kid. As I look at Joseph's story, I, I kind of believe that he restaged this pain from his past for a reason because it gave him a chance to deal with the hurt. I think in some ways, he, he, I think, I don't know, per, the scriptures don't tell us that. I, I, I kind of wonder when he first, maybe he heard his brothers before he saw them. He picked up the Hebrew and he understood the dialect from his particular area. He knew their voice maybe before he saw, he saw them. And so I have to wonder in those few moments before he kind of addresses them, it was kind of that fight or flight idea. Do I just bail out on this whole thing and, and just ignore it and, and bury it in the past and just let the past be the past? Or do I actually kind of step into this and figure out my way through it with God's help? So I think... By, by stepping back and, and re-engaging with his brothers, it gives him an opportunity to deal with the hurt. There was a, there was a phrase that I heard um, just recently, and it, said, it went this way. It said, revealing leads to healing. And I thought about that, and, and I heard somebody make a comment the other day that said, until you're willing to kind of confront the hardship and the hurt, you can't get past the hardship and the hurt. And I, didn't, I, I never understood that. Until recently, and I talk about my, my family a little bit, quite a bit, I guess, but my dad had, um, he, he was a Vietnam vet and had, had gone through Vietnam War, and, um, and that was stuff he never talked about with us as kids growing up. I, other than the fact I saw some pictures of him when he was like in good shape and had some like crazy guns, carrying a crazy gun, that was kind of weird. Um, but I, I didn't understand all that because he never talked about it. He never shared kind of his experiences and, and the things he saw and the things he went through in Vietnam. And it seemed like dad did a pretty good job of just burying that stuff in the past and raising us the best he could. And, and I thought he did a pretty good job. But as we come to find out, there was so much there that had taken its toll over his life that he had never really dealt with. And, and through different measures, obviously he, 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 had, he had struggled with PTSD, a post-traumatic stress syndrome. He, dad was... Um, Dad was a t tunnel rat, if that makes any, any, if you understand what that is. I didn't understand what it was until you start to read through it, and you go, oh, oh, my gosh. Um, you read through it. I'm not going to describe it all. It, it's, it's pretty graphic. But that messed with him. And, and for, instead of kind of dealing with that, he just kind of suppressed all that stuff, kind of buried it way in the back and never really dealt with it. But over the last couple of years, he's been having an opportunity to kind of, kind of deal with this hurt and anger and heartache and help other guys like that are you know soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan deal with their stuff too and these and it was just really kind of amazing to see and I see in some ways Joseph is kind of doing that the past hurt in Joseph's life kind of resurfaces and instead of burying it or ignoring it he chooses to address it he kind of says hey instead of running away from the situation I'm going to deal with it he had learned I believe Joseph had learned not to dwell on it and I believe that's something that God wants us to understand. We need to learn how not to dwell on stuff. But what he had failed to do was really deal with it. He learned not to dwell with it, but he had never really dealt with it. And so he invites God in to help him learn how to deal with it. And here again, I think that's something that a lot of times we need to, need to take kind of Joseph's example and his advice and, and do the same thing. Invite God in to help us deal with some hurt and heartache from your past. Because sometimes you're, you're going to carry that, and you will inevitably carry it into your other relationships. It will show up somewhere, somehow. It does. And a lot of people think, well, no, it doesn't. I'm doing a good job. It will show up. It will show up. Trust me, without fail, it will show up somewhere. If you were raised by a perfectionist, your perfection tendencies show up as you ask your kids to become perfect. It shows up. It shows up, and it does damage in ways. Let me offer you, if I can, just some advice. If, if you're at that place where God's kind of giving you an opportunity to deal with, with some hurt and some heartache as you, as you prepare for that, don't just pray, Father, help me forgive my father, or Father, help me forgive, you know, God, help me forgive my mom. Don't just do that. God actually asked you to kind of go a little bit deeper than that. Not only what they did, but the hurt that you experienced. To be able to, to, to share that, to be honest with yourself and, and be able to tell God kind of those hurtful details. Not just about they did this and they did that, but more of 
here's how I hurt. Here's where I'm hurt. Here's where I'm damaged. Here's what's, what's happened in my heart. One of the most challenging, yet I think encouraging scriptures in the Bible is found in Psalm 51.6. It says this. It says, you, God, desire truth in the inward parts. I love that verse for several reasons. God kind of pushes us to be honest with him and with ourselves, but he also tells us that when you are brutally honest with yourself and with me, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to run away. I'm not afraid of that. I actually already know about it. I just need you to know about it. I need you to deal with it. And what's awesome is if you read that, that psalm, if you read Psalm 51.6, that verse, it talks about God desiring truth in the inward parts. The following verses, you know what it talks about? Cleansing and joy and restoration. That's what follows us being honest with God and with ourselves in those areas that, that maybe we've been hurt or that heartache we've experienced, being, being honest with God in it and inviting him into that. It's difficult to revisit those, the pain from the past, but the, the cool thing is you don't make that journey alone. You invite God in to do his work there. It may take a long time. For some people, I've known some people it's taken them a lifetime because there's just a lot of stuff there's just a lot of hurt and there's a lot of heartache that they've been carrying through their life. Family pain is the deepest pain because it involves people that we believed were trustworthy. That's why it hurts so much. That's why, that's why when, we, when we say things, and, and I have to be reminded of this and, and ask God to help me with this, that when I say things that, that are harsh, and things that, that do hurt, that hurt goes deep, especially as it has, it has impact in my family's life. The echoes of that kind of hurt and that kind of heartache can resonate for years. And if you let them, they can define you. They can start to define you. That hurt and that heartache. Here's the neat thing, it doesn't have to. Look at this promise that God gives us in Romans 12. Verse two, New Living Translation says it this way. It says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's powerful. Because a lot of times, if you've been in an environment or there's this generational garbage that's just been continually passed down, you begin to buy in and you begin to believe the lies and the faulty information that you've been told. Either they were said to you or implied that you are damaged, you're... You're, you're a failure, you're, you know, you're, you're dumb, you're whatever. You start to buy into that. God says you're loved. God says you're his. God says you have a glorious future if you're his child. So let the truth set us free, you know? Let what God says set us free. Let God set us on a path toward reconciliation. And that's what Joseph does. It's interesting as you read through the story of Joseph, the process that Joseph goes through kind of dealing with his brothers, it actually occupies four chapters in the Bible and about a year on the calendar. I know we read through it, we read through four chapters in like five minutes and we think all this stuff happens. It takes a year for all this to kind of unfold and for Joseph to deal with, man, this, this was hurt and they, they hated me and they tried to kill me and they decided to sell me and... and how dare my dad just abandon me like that and just send me out there? And he has like a year to deal with all this and just struggle through it. And then he takes this incredible first step. And it's amazing as you read this because this first step, it almost, you can almost miss it if, if, if you're reading through the story too quick. But he takes this really hesitant, cautious first step. But it's a first step. He kind of goes, okay, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to do something about this hurt and this heartache and this damage and this dysfunction that our family has had for generations at this point. And after three days, Joseph released his brothers from prison, and he kind of plays the tough guy again. Genesis 42, 18 says, on the third day, Joseph said to them, I fear God, do this, and you will live. He's still kind of, kind of playing the tough guy. He says, if you're honest, let one of you be confined to the guardhouse while the rest of you go and take grain to relieve the hunger of your households. Bring your youngest brother to me so that your words can be confirmed. Then you won't die. And so what happens is he offers this kind of this agreement to the brothers. And they all kind of right there agree to this agreement. They all say, okay, that's what we'll do. But then right there in front of Joseph, 
They remember and they rehash the day that they put him in the pit. What's interesting is they don't know that Joseph understands everything they're saying. Up until this point, there's been an interpreter with them. And Joseph's kind of playing it back and forth. They would speak, the interpreter would tell Joseph what they said. Joseph fully understood what they said. Joseph would speak, the interpreter would tell them what he said. And so he's playing this whole thing. And so here again, these brothers are, are told, here's the agreement, I'll keep one of you, I'll send the nine back. This is how this is gonna go. And at that moment that they're released from prison, they remember and they rehash the day that they threw him in the pit. Verse 21, then they said to each other, obviously, we are being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his deep distress when he pleaded with us, but we would not listen. That is why this trouble has come to us. And again, they, they, they didn't know who this prince was. They didn't know that he understood Hebrew, but he does. And the scripture would tell us that in that moment when Joseph hears their words, that he turns away from them because he didn't want them to see his eyes filling up with tears. That he heard them talking and in that moment, he turns away from them because he didn't want them to see him starting to get emotional. And he steps into the shadows and he weeps. And I found this incredibly powerful because as you look across Joseph's life, he didn't cry when he was promoted from, by Potiphar from you know, field slave to personal assistant and overseer of the house. He doesn't cry then with this incredible Honor. He doesn't cry when, when Pharaoh appoints him as prime minister, but he completely breaks down and he's completely overwhelmed the moment he learns that his brothers had not forgotten him, after all. He's just overwhelmed by that. He thought his brothers hated him so much and then just once he was out of mind and, he was, and out of sight, he was out of mind, that they wouldn't remember him any longer, they wouldn't care about him anymore, and he hears them speaking. And I want you to watch what happens next. Genesis 42, verse 25. It says, Joseph then gave orders to fill their containers with grain, return each man's money to his sack, and give them provisions for their journey. They had come down there with sacks full of money to buy grain. He puts all the grain in their containers, fills them to the brim. He puts all of their money back in their sack, and over and above that, he gives them all the provisions they would need to make their journey home. It's a moment of grace. It's a moment of grace that this brother that had been so wronged and so mistreated and felt like he had been forgotten and abandoned steps up to the plate and says, I don't know how to work through all this hurt and this heartache, but I know the first step is grace. I know the first step is I gotta, I gotta extend myself. And with this small act, healing begins doesn't fix everything. Like I said, it's going to take a year for all of this to kind of get worked through, but that was the first step. It, and, and, and what's amazing to me, you guys, is, is, the, is what we tend to do is if we're the hurt one, if we're the one that's gotten the damage, we sit back and we believe the first step is on them because they did it. They caused it. And you know what this story tells me? The first step is on the one that may have been hurt to take that step of grace, to try to restore and mend that relationship because ultimately that's what God wants. He wants our hearts whole and our relationships restored. So we're gonna close this morning. I just wanna ask you to think about this and consider this. If, you're, if you've gone through some difficulties or maybe there's some, some, some struggle and some conflict in your family, if God could bring healing to Joseph and his family. Don't you think he can bring it to you and yours as well? Don't you think that our God's that big? And don't you think he cares about you and your family as much as he cares about Joseph and his? He does. And there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. There's, there's perpetual healing or there's perpetual heartache just kind of sitting and writing on your next move, your next decision, your next words. There can be healing or there can be heartache. Which one do you choose? I encourage you to let God in. Let him do his work in, in all of those areas of hurt or, or heartache or hardship, whatever it is. And I, I know I'm convinced that you'll find that God's grace is more than enough. You'll be amazed by it, and then you'll be challenged to become a conduit of that grace. That God's grace is more than enough to bring healing 
and, and to bring restoration. But we have to let him. We have to let him in. And, and, and this is the biggest struggle. This is the hardest fight for a lot of us because we feel right to be angry and to hold the grudge. We feel we're right. They didn't do me right. They mistreated me. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't. And God says, that's okay. You can tell me all that. Tell me how it hurt you. Now the next step is I want it to be a step of grace. I want it to be a step of forgiveness because that's where healing begins. You will never be healed and you will never be whole if you continue to hold on to that grudge. It won't happen. And there's a lot at stake. I think sometimes we think, well, that's mine. You're impacting people that come behind you. You're, you're demonstrating by, by life and by example how to deal with hurt. And in a sense, what we're communicating to our kids and to others is that it's okay to stay angry, to stay bitter, to always kind of hold on to that. And God says, that's not, what it's, that's not what it's about. That's not what I'm trying to, that's not what I want to do in your life. That's not what I did for you. It's not what I want you to do in up for others. We're going to stand. We'll sing a, a verse as we close this morning. Let me just remind you, let's be reminded this morning of this thought. God not only wants your whole heart, he wants your heart whole. Just be reminded of that this morning as we uh, prepare to close.